he he came in and spoke to the kids, and I think it was very important for them to hear that message um, from someone that's been there and been on top of the world, and then to not be on top of the world is it's kind of devastating for for whoever that person is. So it was really important for that to happen. Name Wally Judge. Uh, went to high school at Bladensburg, then transferred to Arlington Country Day. From there, I went to Kansas State University and finished at Rutgers. Um, came out of high school, McDonald's All American in 2009, Parade All American, Jordan Brand Classic All American, uh, pretty much the whole nine yards. I know a little bit about him. I know he played at Kansas State, um, you know, but I didn't know his story. So, with me not being from this area, I didn't know his story, but to hear his story, um, you know, it made me, you know, sit back and think. Well, one, I didn't know too much about Wally before he came because, again, uh, I'm not from the area. Um, so, and trying to know everybody that's good from this area is really hard to do because um, it's a hotbed. I've known Wally for a long time. Uh, I thought it was very important to bring him in because I knew. You know, he's a few generations removed. You know, he's closer to my age than these kids, so these kids probably wouldn't know uh, much about him, his history, because, you know, he didn't really, uh, you know, make it the way, you know, like make it enough. You know, he made it McDonald's, you know, all those type of things that, you know, as a high school player, you'd always want to strive to be, but after that, he didn't really have to have a college career or, you know, pro career. Yeah, DC so one of those guys was the first time I actually even got on a plane. But, um,. I didn't even know when I got ranked. <laughs> I had a couple of tournaments. I showed up at school one day. A younger guy on our team was like, um, I want to be like you when I grow up. I'm like, what you talking about? He's like, uh, I want to be ranked in the country like you. So I'm like, man, I'm not ranked. I go get on the computer, I pull it up, number 23 in the country. So then it was kind of like, it went from being the, the most unknown dude to now having like a target on my back. I think at the time, Lance, Lance Stevenson was the head guy. Followed by like Ronaldo Sidney and then uh, Derek Favors, DeMarcus Cousins. And probably after those guys, it was always a mix. And the next thing you know, John and Avery came out of nowhere, Avery Bradley. That, that opened my eyes that like, I had to bring it to the game. Like it was, it was a new element involved now when people know who you are when people have a reason, you know. So from that point on, it was, the circuit became like a job. Because every day I felt like I had to go out there and prove that I'm one of the best in the country. <laughs> but you know that you kind of find out that you're a McDonald's All-American before the season ends. <laughs> so the other teams know it too. And I used to get a lot, of, a lot of crap from the other guys on teams, like just trying to get me out of my comfort zone. So even away from basketball, it was like now, not only are people trying to beat you on the court, they want to beat you off the court. Because guys that do things that make you, you know, impulsively react, you know, hit a guy, push a guy down, then all of a sudden you're, you're a bad character. So a lot of times, you know, with that, with that accolade, you deal with a lot of the, the cheap stuff. You know, you deal with the cheap shots, getting hit in the ribs, smacked in the face. Um, even referees, you know, I've had a referee tell me like, um, let's see how good you really are. Or guy smacked me in my face, knocked the ball out of bounds. I asked him, was it a foul? Rep tell him, man, he's 6'10". So, you know, even though I had felt like I had arrived, it was still more to prove to sustain what I had built. So, you know, it, it was some, some different things that went on. Like, uh, like you said, random people coming up offering money, maybe with no knowledge of affiliation or wherever. They're just like, hey, we like them, we want to get known. And as a high school kid, it's, 
is like it's unbelievable. You know, at one point I used to have to, you know, just leave my house, go to the rec center, because they wouldn't stop like college coaches or newspapers or agents and stuff wouldn't stop calling my house. And it just, you know, it can be it can be overbearing. And as a kid, you can lose focus on why you really do it. And then it starts to not be fun. And then it becomes a job. Um, that's why, like, now when I talk to kids, I just always tell them, like, man, keep it fun. Me and Rodney Magruder, we became really, really close friends along the way. So we just always agreed that if one person went to this school, the other one would go too. And I was heavily considering Georgetown. I called and I spoke with one of the coaches on the staff at the time. He, real close friend, but he gave me the truth. He said, man, we know you're going to be an All-American. We know you're going to be a really good player. But unfortunately, you're coming in now, you're going to be backing up Greg Monroe. He was like, you know, the lottery pick. So you're going to have to earn your stuff, but you're probably not going to play it. Pick in the 2010 NBA draft, the Detroit Pistons select Greg Monroe from Georgetown University. I was, I was under the pressure of, I might be out here at Midnight Madness, or I might be in my freshman dorm, but my mom's in, you know, homeless shelter. So I felt that Kansas State was going to be the best place to... I guess expose what I can do. Um, so we went out there, we went to the Midnight Madness. And we seen how everybody welcomed Mike and Bill and you know Jacob. We seen how Frank was using the team. So we was like, we could play here. Um, so then eventually I chose him. And like I said, it was a family connection with the DC Assault thing. Everybody's on the same scale now. Don't matter what you was coming out of high school. I always tell everybody, I, I, I thought Frank Martin, I still believe Frank Martin's a great coach. You know, I learned a lot in my time there. But um, for me and him, it just didn't necessarily click. Uh, partially because I knew what I was coming into college as. And I had, you know, I had trained myself to be uh, you know, a uh, power forward slash small forward. I got to college, they made me a center. We had top 20 recruiting class and I'm headlining it, but I'm coming off the bench behind a, no offense to him, and I end up being a great player, but behind a, like a one-star prospect, two-star prospect. So it was like a mental game. It's like, man, I'm coming in, I got all this, you know, clout, or I got all this, you know, all these accolades behind me. And then I'm, I'm showcasing it in the practice, like, why am I not starting? I felt like my talent was kind of being jerked around. Like, one moment you want me to be a star, next moment you want me to be, you know, a bandmate. And as a 19-year-old kid with, a, you know, a lot of lack of people to look up to, you don't really know how to handle it. So, you know, I, I became depressed. Fresh me into winning is what cured the depression. So I didn't have to worry about feeling down and sad because everybody loved you, you know. Top three in the country, beating all these teams. So when it was a little bit different, it was like being the McDonald's All-American again. Because now we're number three in the country, everybody coming for us. Now I'm in the starting position, but it's still not, still something missing. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not getting the, I guess I couldn't be me. And I'm trying to figure out how to incorporate it into the system while showcasing my talent, but it was like, um, we could just never find a balance between me and Frank. So once again, the depression started kicking in, we started losing. We lost six straight. Um, winter break was hell. Like it was like, all we did was work out morning to night. We get in the gym seven in the morning. We ain't leaving until late at night. 
just from the study hall, the weights, the individuals, the, and it was hell. Um, probably the worst three weeks of my life. I had shut down. Shut down was, was just, you know, go to class, come back to, come back to the house. Um, go to class, come back to the house. And it was kind of like, I, I kind of gave him warning signs of it. Like I told, like one day I was coming from class and so I was going to practice and I was just like, I ain't going. Turned my phone off, went over to one of my homegirls' house, told her if anybody called for me, you don't know where I'm at. And I just stayed there because I needed like that peace. And like I sat down, I had talked to, you know, the coaches about it. I told him, like, man, like, it ain't fun no more for me. Like, uh, I don't like playing right now. You know, it's becoming a business. And so I kind of gave him, you know, the, the full, I guess, the full warning of it that apparently whatever was going on coaching and playing wise just wasn't meshing. And at that point, I had no balance. You know, it was like basketball wasn't working out, my home situation was still in shambles. So then one morning I just got up and I looked at it and I'm like, I ain't feeling it. I think it was like nine games left in the season. I was like, I ain't feeling it. Because number one is like, I couldn't play because I wasn't happy. So even if I got in the game, I wouldn't produce the way I should have. Um, so in turn, I just went to Frank like a man. I just told him, uh, I feel like it's best to, you know, like we part ways. You know, I think you're a great coach, but I think I just need to find something different to better myself. And then in turn, he said he would help me out. And then we started the transfer period. But then after the fact, you know, once I'm sitting out waiting for the season to end, like I said, I'm getting hate mail. Like something that I've never seen before. And there's a 19 year old, 20 year old kid is like, you try to grasp the idea of someone hating you because of a sport. Because when everybody love you, you don't realize it that they love you because of a sport. They love you because you can dunk, because you can jump around and do all these exceptional things, extraordinary things. And then it's like, for those same reasons, somebody will hate you because you don't do it for them. And I received a, uh, like a five paragraph letter on Thanksgiving saying to kill myself, calling me all different types of racial slurs, saying that they were thankful that I was no longer a wildcat and that I was a waste of talent, deserved to die, you know. And as, a, like I said, a 19-year-old, 20-year-old kid, it's like, who sits out and takes the time to write that to a kid? Able to live through it together, and it brings you closer. I'm Wally Judge, Rutgers basketball player, and this is who we are. Like, what drew me there was Coach Cox, because he, he cared about me more as a player. You know what I mean? He cared about me more than just being a player. He, um, you know, he like, we'd walk into the gym, he wouldn't even ask me, you know, what we need to work on today. He'd be like, how's everything going? How's the family? How's this? And so it took that pressure off and let me be a player. Unfortunately, the whole <laughs> Mike Rice saga transpired. Sports World is still reacting to the stunning video that outside the lines up uh, obtained, which shows Rutgers head basketball coach Mike Rice throwing basketballs and yelling obscenities and homophobic slurs at his players. And which led to him being uh, terminated or resigning. Um, so then I had to endure another coach. So in four years of college, five years of college, I had three different coaches. Uh, Wally's mom is uh, Jamo's mom's sister, so I kind of uh, got. I kind of have a relationship with Wally through Jamo. At the end, my name is James Hampton, 6'5", 17 years old, from Washington D.C. <laughs> uh, we asked, uh, he was with Coach Ty, and we was with Beacon House, and we all used to. All he do was Jamo. Jamo was uh, it was really tough, tough pill to swallow because. Uh, Again, as a kid, I really know. I know his circumstances, I know his situation. And then the first time I met uh, J-Mo, my dad had brought him home from a football practice. Uh, he was about 10, 10 years old. I think the last time we played against him when we were little was uh, when we first came over to DC Premier. Uh, he was with Beacon House, I think, what, 12 and under? 
and he was just jawing and stuff. Uh, because Friday nights they used to come over to, uh, to my house and stay with my dad because they played Saturday mornings and they had, they had, uh, he wanted to make sure that all the kids were there and fed and had enough energy for the, for the game day. Uh, he comes from a situation of, of, of a Section 8 kid. He comes from poverty. I'm just gonna flat out say it, I'm not sugarcoating it. It's... It became like a, I guess, I guess it became a ritual for him to come over every Friday. And that's where he felt like, he felt comfortable to come over and then it just continuously started to happen. Like, uh, started from the weekends to like the summertime. I think every, every summer since he was 11, on the last day of school, he would show up at my house and stay the whole summer. You know, he was always a person that needed help. Uh, financially needed, you know, resources. His parents, they 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 could take care of him, but it wasn't to the to the fullest extent. As a lot of you know, inner city kids are, and you know, T and his father, um, Ty, did a lot for him. They even took him in, um, as they did his nephew as well. Now, Cardo. I was I would say financially they weren't capable to do the best they, to do the most for them. That whatever I needed them to help with, they helped. Whatever, whatever my dad needed them to help with, they, they, off, they uh, always helped. Like they would send food stamps, give us food stamps so we could go grocery shopping, so it was food for him to eat. It was a point where he came to Premier to play with us. And he was, we was all in the uh, room together. And he was just talking about how he, how he gonna get his family out the situation that they in and, and how he gonna provide for them. And, and just how he just wanted to just, just just to play basketball, basically. He didn't want to be around the negativity. I just know um, one of my coach coach on Lil T. I just I know he's a, like a role model, so I just want to stay around kid, people that got degrees in college, that play college, that on a high level, that know the game. So I just listen to what he's saying, just take notes. He knew he wanted to play basketball. He knew he wanted to go to school but he never really saw anybody in his life doing that. And I think I was, that, I was that person that was in his life that was going to school, playing basketball, and like accomplishing everything that I wanted to accomplish. Me wanted to be around all positive energy or people who wanted to get to the same level as him. My dad coached them in basketball, so, so he put together AAU team with all like inner city kids. Uh, he, he used Beacon House and then he went over to Trinidad Rec and got some of those kids and, and kind of uh, put them together. He started out in like D2 Nationals and they would go and like they would, they would go and like be competitive but they would lose. To start off like man all right this is where we at. We gonna grow. Nobody, no, I mean everybody don't get frustrated. I know y'all want to win but we and we gonna be in games with people, but we gonna, we gonna work our way up. Started his high school career at Bell as a ninth grader. Uh, he was probably one of the best kids in the league as a ninth grader. He uh, averaged the most points throughout the whole DCIAA. But uh, Bell, he got Bell to the playoffs, I think, for the first time in ever. And uh, they, they lost to Coolidge. They were the AC, they lost to Coolidge in the first round. It's just sad, sad that, that that happened to him. Yeah. Cause that's all he wanted to do was get his family out of the situation there. I was I was present when he fainted up at Rock Creek. We were, we were we were playing in a game like an outside outside league up at Rock Creek. Uh, he was running he was like running down the court. I didn't I didn't see him like I didn't see like what he was doing like his man his mannerisms before he passed out. But somebody said like he, they saw him grab his his grab his chest and then he fell near the bench and then like it looked like he was seizing. But at the, and then at the same time, it looked like he could he could have had a heart attack, but we didn't like we didn't know what was going on. So people called the ambulance. Uh, I was right there, like with him, hold like holding his head and stuff. Um, a, a ref at the, a ref that was refing the game like did CPR on him, and I don't know if that was the right thing to do or not, but it's, it, it it brought him back to life, or he started moving and breathing again. And then uh, we went to the ambulance. Ambulance took him to Howard. They they came back and said, "Well, nothing is wrong. He just was dehydrated or mal, mal malnourished." So we like, "All right, cool." He, he uh, 
get him, get him hydrated, feed him as much as he want, and now he'd be he'd be good to go. So we didn't really think much of it. And unfortunately, when you come from these type of circumstances, your health and your attention to health is not always is not always paid the same way as other kids. So that's which is why I always go back to what I say about you know a lot of these kids need to really be thankful that they come from the circumstances they come into and are born into the situations they're born into. And then after that, like he was, he was, he had, a, he didn't play basketball for like a good two, two months, two to three months, just until like he, they kind of ran all the tests. Because for some people, basketball is their salvation, but for most kids, they'll be good either way. Like no matter what, you'll be going to college. No matter what, you'll be going to a good school. No matter what, you'll have a good life. It's all about when you have a great life and doing what you love. JMO basketball was his salvation because without that is the streets or it was, you know, the wrong things like his friends were doing. I don't know, my, my dad, he was, he was confused. Like he was trying to, he was trying to understand like what's going on and like why is he passing out? And whenever we take him to the doctor, they say, oh, nothing's wrong with him, he good. So they, they're actually, him, my dad and his dad is actually in the process of, you know, getting paperwork so they can kind of, you know, uh, file a lawsuit against uh, the hospital. The first time I sat out, they're like, don't touch the basketball, you can't play basketball. And then he came back and then it happened again. Then it's just like, damn, like, something really wrong. Like. I think after that time, after that second time we passed out at Rock Creek, he, he kind of he kind of got like, I don't know, that changed him a little bit. Like he he became a little different for a little while. Like he wasn't the same funny kid. Like you be looking at him like, what? What you doing? Like he started doing some stuff that he like wouldn't do. I can't really pinpoint something that he did, but he was, you could tell like he was off. He wasn't the same J-Mo that, you know, that you have around you, always make you laugh and just want to be around. Like, something was different about him. So I think that, I think that second one was like kind of uh, changed him. But then he kind of started like gravitating back to himself and eventually became back J-Mo. Cause like, I'm telling you, like when he first fainted, he, he like got out of his, I guess he was in a coma. When he got out of this little coma, like the hospital put him in that coma, but he's a med he was medically induced. Uh, when he came out that coma, Herb, Sam, Sam, Sean, Sam, and Keo, man, what's wrong with Jamo, man? He, he acting weird, like that ain't that ain't Jamo, that ain't Jamo. And we always used to joke with him, like, hey, we about to go hoop, Jamo, or like, uh, <laughs> you tired? You, you need some water? You gonna pass out? Like we used to joke with him like that, just because that's. That's what we did. Like that's the kind of relationship we had. Whenever, whenever we, all, whenever we went to go play basketball, that was always some on my mind. Like, man, what if, what if he pass out while we here? What, like, what I'm gonna do? So, at first he'd be like, man, I'm about to go play. I, I, he, like, I will. Always, I'm always playing basketball. So he's like, man, I'm trying to come. Or you got a game today? I'm trying to come play. Cause I would let him play in the men's leagues and stuff like that. Just because he wasn't playing any basketball at all. I'm like, man, Jamo, I don't, like, I don't know, I don't, I don't trust it yet. They ain't, they ain't really say much about what happened, so I ain't letting you get back out there. And he's like, all right, all right, all right, all right. But then, then he got back, like, he just started becoming himself again, so I'm like, all right, he good, he could, he could play, he could play. Cause Statement didn't even let him play. Just because they like they, it's like, man, nah, we, we don't want him to play, man. We scared, we saw that happen, like, we don't want that to happen again. We got. Get, make sure you're clear about the doctors. Make sure you got the right, you know, right, right follow-up stuff to come back and play with us. So they didn't let him play. So he, he went to another AAU team, and uh, it happened again. So moving on to senior year, his uh, his his prep year, high school, he went to Liberty Heights, Liberty Heights, which he uh, was down in North Carolina. So he played AAU with Team United, and then Hampton, EYBL. I guess that was the session to make Peace Jam, which they had already made Peace Jam, so like he didn't even like he didn't even have to go. And I, I mean, I I remember he was at my house before he left, like begging me, like T man, please, I'm trying to go. I'm like, there's no point to go. Like you don't like y'all already qualified for Peace Jam. And uh, Jay Heath, he played on uh, Jay Heath played on uh, Team Mellow, so he like, man, I'm gonna call Jay Mom. I'm gonna call Jay Mom. What's what's Jay mother number? I'm trying to get down there. I want to go. I want to go. I'm like, nah, Jamo, you don't need to go. Like, if you miss the ride, they ain't set it up for you. It, it don't make sense to go. Like, you you trying to force your way down there. Like, how you, you get down there, how you gonna get back? 
I'm gonna just ride with Jay Mother. I'm gonna just ride with Jay Mother. I'm like, what if she don't got no space? How you know she wanna, you know, be responsible, be responsible for you to? And I'm like, man, look, you already, you already, the coaches ain't, you know, ain't make it a way for you to get there this time, man. Look, just, just let it, just let it go. Just stay home. And then I, this, the, this the weekend that my AAU team was playing too. I was just telling them, man, just come watch us play, and, and see, and see how well his nephew, nephew played. And then just chalk it up, work out, and go to Peace Jam, and, and you know, and be ready for Peace Jam. So new team, I got to pick up how players play and coach, how they coach. So I just want to get an opportunity to showcase my talent. You know, when I asked him about like, why do you keep playing? His response was simple: If I don't play basketball, I'm gonna be dead or in jail anyway. So that's all that's around me. So I rather I might as well take the risk dying, doing something I love that's gonna change my life. And I I gotta respect that because. He may not have gone to college without basketball. He wasn't the best student. He may not, he definitely family, definitely couldn't afford it. So, you know what I mean? He may not have been an active member of society, not doing what he loves. He may have turned to the streets like so many people around him were doing, so. I think, I think Team United got him a bus ticket down. And uh, uh, I, I, I didn't even, I, I was like, man, he, he just texted me like, I'm in Hampton. And that's the last, that's like the last text message I got from him. I'm in Hampton. At five, new information about the death of a Charlotte High School basketball player. James Hampton collapsed on the court at a weekend tournament in Virginia. I heard the news. I was, matter of fact, I was just coming home from um, Mount Bird. I'm like, man, he passed out again. Oh, let me let me call his dad. Let me call his dad. And they like, he not responding. He not responding. But I'm like, all right, the first couple of the first two times they like, he not responding. He not responding. I'm like a third time. I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like the sound of that. They say they always say the third time is a charm. And I'm like, nah. I don't, again, I don't know if he's gonna make make this one. A Marvin, Marvin Price called me from Patterson. He called me and told me that um, Jamo passed out again. I couldn't believe it. Um, I was calling um, T. I was calling T. I was calling um, Tune Day and them. Just to just to make make sure it wasn't true. I was, I couldn't believe it. Like I was telling it was not true. I was telling myself it wasn't true. And um, the next morning, I heard it was true, and I just couldn't believe it. When I heard about it, I was just like damn, like you know what I'm saying, like what's going on? When you see something like that, it obviously somebody loses their life, but it also affects so many other people. But to hear his story about. Him taking a bus to get there and, and to try to, to play on that stage and get seen and, and then that happened is it's pretty awful. Um, I wasn't at that specific gym, um, but I, I'll remember that, that day uh, for a while, maybe forever. Um, it was definitely a dark day um, in the prep circuit industry. Um, anytime any, a, a child really dies on the basketball floor doing something they love, that's, that's really hard to uh, digest. Matter of fact, I seen him. I seen him two days before because he was at Wilson. He was working out with T, and I he asked me to work out, and I said, nah, I was like, I had to go home. It was a break for this EYBL session, so he was at my house, and he like, I'm in Hampton, and we was playing, and they was playing, so I never really got to text him back. And um, he was tell he told us that he was going to commit to uh, Hampton, and I was, I was like, congratulations and all that other stuff. And I was just happy for him, man, proud of him. And he was, he was proud of us. That's all he, that's all he wanted was all, everybody to eat, everybody get their families out of the situation they was in. You know, I, I, I'm always remember him for sure. And, you know, I always remember all the jokes, you know, all the, the you know, how he used to crack on me, tell, tell jokes, or me telling him he was too young to play with us, you know, after we had our events at Wilson. I played for him also. He's one of the people I played for because he, he related to me because I won't get my, my family out of the situation that they in. And I, and I just miss him. I wish I could talk to him. And I love him. You know, when he was young, he was like in seventh, eighth grade. He used to always want to try to play pickup with us. Me, T, Howie, some other guys. Like, <clears throat> we always tell him he was too young. Then he grew up, ended up being like 6'6. Six, six. Um, so, you know, I've I really I've known him. I love him. I miss him. And, uh, you know, hopefully. Uh, it should be a cautionary tale to people to, you know, first of all, to parents, you know, be more active in your with your children. 
and monitor their health and to other kids appreciate what you have because this kid didn't do anything to anybody and unfortunately lost his life doing what he loved. So, you know, appreciate what you have because everybody's not born into the circumstances that he was born into. You're blessed to be, especially in an era where kids want to be hood kids and kids want to be fake in the streets and blah, blah, blah. Like, this is a kid who come from that who didn't want anything to do with it. And he'd be the first to tell you that. on the next episode of Run This Town. The whole time you start to see this is like real life now. If I don't do what they need me to do, like I'm fired. Like this ain't no, you just getting benched for a game. <laughs> like you going home. Set it, set it, Kel. That's not a foul.